it is an honor and a privilege to be with you today, those of you present here in the sanctuary, as those uh, also worshiping with us through the gift of technology. I did give my pastors a Christmas gift um, and said I would preach for them and they could take a Sunday off. So I'm grateful for this opportunity and for Becky Shirley and Austin Lippert and the ministry that goes on at this church. I have many fond memories of Washington Street. When I was chaplain at Columbia College from 96 to 2000, this was my home church where I worshiped along with my family. My daughter was taught in children's church by Nan Self. Um, So just a lot of wonderful, wonderful memories and grateful to have this opportunity to worship with you today. Our scripture lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 12, chapter chapter 12, verses 12 through 31a. I'm actually going to read all the way to the end of 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think are less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Let us pray. Bless, O Lord, the reading, preaching, and hearing of this, your holy word, so that the word become flesh might be in our midst. Amen. I have met many people over the years, and I'm sure you have too, who say they do not like organized religion. I want to say to them, well, do you like disorganized religion? Because that's sometimes what the church looks like. What they mean by that is they don't like the institutional aspects of religion, rules and and boundaries and bureaucracy and committees, Gil Rendell, a consultant, leadership consultant, and a United Methodist minister and a published author, calls it the institutional hairball. That institutional hairball that sometimes seems to get in the way of ministry. I know it all too well, being in the position I've been in for eight years. Well, to those people who don't like organized religion, I have some good news for you. Oswald Chambers, that famous 20th century theologian, said 
The body of Christ is an organism, not an organization. An organism is a living, breathing, growing body. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul, as you know, was writing to a troubled church at Corinth in a city much like Columbia. It was made up of diverse and transient people. It was a port city. There was a lot of trade going on, so many different people came through this city. Outside influences of pagan culture had seeped their way into the Christian community. And that Christian community was very diverse. It was made up of Greeks who had converted and Jews who had converted, Gentiles and Jews, slaves and free, all trying to figure out how to be one body in Christ. And there were conflicts that emerged because they were trying to one-up each other on who had the better spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. There was much division. If you are concerned about division and conflict within our broader denomination or within the church here or any church, then simply read the book of Corinthians where there was drunkenness and gluttony at the Lord's table noise and disrespect in worship, immorality and conflict and division. We come to understand that these problems of the church today are not unlike the problems in Corinth. It is helpful to know not only how this passage sits within the context of the city of Corinth, but how it sits within the context of the broader letter and to see how Paul flows through these sections. In verses 4 through 11, Paul explains that God has given a variety of gifts, wisdom, knowledge, miracles, prophecy, and even speaking in tongues. Paul says in verses 27 through 31 that these various gifts express themselves in a variety of functions, so that there are apostles and teachers and people who heal and those who evangelize, and those with gifts of miracle, everybody with different gifts has a different function in the body. This passage is followed by that beautiful, famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13, often read at weddings, but intended particularly for this church community. And it is that passage about the greatest gift, which is love. So here we have it, spiritual gifts, the body of Christ, and love all interdependent to make the recipe for a healthy organism. The first point that Paul wants to make to us this morning is that each part of the body looks differently. Look at your own body. Look at your own hands, just for an example. Are they identical? On one finger, I have an old injury from playing volleyball in high school. Kind of a a larger knuckle, maybe. There might be a scar on your hand from a particular accident. Even your two hands do not look alike. The makeup, the personality, the faith, the life experience, the traditions, all within each person are different. No two people in the body of Christ look alike. At Corinth, there was differences between Jews and Greeks and Gentiles and slave and free and male and female, And they all came with different perspectives on how to practice faith. And in that early day of the church, they didn't have a lot of guidelines. They didn't have a book of discipline. Maybe that's a good thing. They didn't have a a written scripture. They had lots of letters from Paul and fragments of faith. They were trying to work it out in community day by day. Paul tells us that we get into trouble when we begin to categorize or rank people in the body of Christ. We do it even today in the hierarchy of the church. In verses 22 through 23, he says that some members who appear to be weaker are actually the more indispensable members. All members of the body are valuable, and there's no cookie-cutter model of faith as if one person's faith or way of doing it is better than another. We should all love the diverse parts of the body. Secondly, not only does every part look differently, but each part acts differently. 
Each person has a unique function based on spiritual gifts as determined by the gifts that God has given. The eye see, but the ear hears. The feet walk, but the hands grasp. Have you ever tried to pick up something with your toes and find that your toes don't work as good at grasping and holding as your fingers do? I remember going through some physical therapy after an ankle injury, and my physical therapist making me pick up marbles with my toes, lift them, and put them into a container. My toes do not work as good as my hands. Have you ever tried to see with your hands instead of your eyes? When I come home at night and it's dark and I, I don't have an outdoor light on and I'm trying to get the key into the door handle, I'm doing it with my hands because I can't see with my eyes and I'm fumbling in the dark. Ever try to get up in the middle of the night in an unfamiliar room and you're grabbing along the wall to find your way to the light switch? Do your hands see as well as your eyes? When you were a child and you could do a handstand and walk on your hands and you would say, look, mom, I'm walking on my hands. But it would only last for a second or two because you cannot walk on your hands as well as you do on your feet. Each part of the body functions in its own unique way. And so it is with the body of Christ. And the key to a healthy body is discerning how does each part function well? What are the gifts that are unique to each person? Doing a spiritual gifts inventory or taking a disciple Bible study can help you discern those gifts. If you're an introvert, you probably don't make a very good greeter. If you're math dyslexic like me, don't be chair of the finance committee. If you have the gift of music, as we heard this morning, then join the choir. If you love working with teenagers, work alongside Mac and Wall with the youth and family ministries. Each part of the body acts according to the unique spiritual gifts. But here's the important point. The parts are all interdependent and interconnected in order for the body to grow healthy. To grow healthy. In their book, Simple Church, Tom Rayner and Eric Geiger use another metaphor of the body of Christ, Mr. Potato Head. I had to borrow this from a pastor who has young children. You remember Mr. Potato Head, right? So all the parts fit together in Mr. Potato Head to make him look almost human. He's got hands and ears and eyes and feet and nose. But the cool thing about Mr. Potato Head is that you can take the parts out. And children often do that and rearrange them so that maybe the ear and the eyes and the nose change places. And so then you have a funny-looking Mr. Potato Head who has a hand coming out where there should be a set of eyes, and perhaps an ear coming out where there should be a mouth. And soon, this is Mrs. Potato Head. I didn't even know they had a Mrs. Potato Head when I was a child. But soon Mrs. Potato Head her, her eyes are where her mouth should be. Her mouth is where her eyes should be. Her hand is where her ear should be. And she looks all discombobulated. And sometimes the church looks like that. Eric Geiger and Tom Rayner write, Unfortunately, sometimes the church looks like a discombobulated Mr. Potato Head. Everything is badly mixed up. The parts of the body are not aligned as they should be. Confusion abounds. While it is funny on the toy, it is not so funny in churches. What happens when the parts are in the wrong place? Or those with spiritual gifts are using them in the wrong way or in the wrong places? What happens when the parts are not interconnected and working in unison? When the left leg goes left? and the right leg goes right, there is a split in the body of Christ. Does our church have unity across the differences, or is the left side going left and the right side going right and resulting in a split body? What happens when the body has no vision, when the eyes are not working properly? It wanders around and gets nowhere and falls down. I remember that 
dialogue between Alice and the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland when she says to the Cheshire cat, which road should I take? And he says, well, it depends on where you want to go. And she says, oh, I don't much care. And he says, well, then it doesn't really matter. Any road will get you there. Do you have a direction? Do you have a vision? I know your church did a strategic plan years ago as a way of setting a direction for the future, but I think that plan was done pre-pandemic. How has the world, how has ministry changed? What is your vision for your future in this particular day and time? What happens if there is a head injury and the brain can no longer communicate to the body? People suffering from head injuries often are immobile, paralyzed. They cannot tell, the brain cannot tell the arm or their leg to move or the mouth to speak. What happens when the brain and the body are disconnected? How is the communication between the head and the body, the head being Jesus Christ? Is there silence and solitude and prayer to discern what is the head telling the body to do? Where is the head telling the body to go? Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15, 19, about the head of the church, the most important part of the body. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things invisible and things visible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. The real key to the healthy organism that we call the church is not so much how great our spiritual gifts are, or how well we function with those gifts in the church. The real important, most essential piece of the body is the head, who must have first place in everything. How is your connection to the head? Is the body listening to the head? Is the body worshiping and faithfully following the head, Jesus Christ? It is the blood from Christ shed for us that gives life to the body. May we remember his sacrifice, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection. May he be the heartbeat, the blood, and most importantly, the head of the body so that we may put him first in everything and that might cause the body to be a healthy, growing organism. Make sure the parts are in the right place, but make sure, first and foremost, the head is the head of the church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.